So what I thought I would do is talk as a writer and a journalist about the last 10 years of the work that I've done looking at how criminals think, because for the last 10 years or so, that is basically what I've been doing, investigating, monitoring, living with, particularly online, bad actors. Actually, I spent six months with Tommy Robinson from the English Defence League, hanging out with him, talk to me about that afterwards if you want to. It all started with the dark net for me back in 2013 when I wrote a book about how the dark net markets worked back when it was really exciting and original. And then spent the last four years of my life looking for Dr. Ruja Ignatova, who is now the world's most wanted woman, who's, um, well, alleged to have committed a multi-billion dollar Ponzi fraud, which I will explain. So I'm kind of like, I see myself as a sort of online Louis Theroux, you know what I mean? A sort of a budget online Louis Theroux, as I explained to the, to the people that put this together. So I I'm going to take you through sort of the, some of those little stories from what I've learned over the last 10 years and what I think that it means, what we can learn from it, particularly as we've just heard about chat GPT and, 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 and why I think we can quite well predict how people are going, to, are going to use this. And the number one lesson really is pretty simple, pretty obvious. Criminals just, I mean, think like you guys. They don't take that the wrong way but they are thinking in exactly the same way about what's the latest tech, how can I pick it up, what can I do with it, how can I employ it effectively in my work to save me time and to save me money. And the minute you realise that that is all they're really doing, I think it starts to get a bit easier to work out what they might do next and how we get ready for it. Okay. Well, I'll start where, I, where it all started for me, really, which was with, uh, with the dark net. And I know probably many of you have, have been on the dark net. been on there buying drugs, anyone? Want to show of hands? Yeah, I mean, uh, I have. And there's people from HMRC here. But uh, I have when I was researching my book. Um, and when I first went onto the, onto the dark net to sort of work out what it was, I was interested in the way that criminals were using it. Of course, the dark net which is access, accessed through the Tor browser usually, is brilliant for, for whistleblowers. It's brilliant for people who want uh, to enhance their privacy. When I'm investigating the gigantic OneCoin Ponzi scheme, I use Tor when I go onto their website, of course. So it's a fantastic tool, but obviously it's also very valuable for people that want to keep themselves hidden for nefarious reasons. And one of the most common ways is, of course, the dark net marketplaces. So these turned up really in around 2011, 2012. You've probably all heard of the Silk Road drugs marketplace. Uh, and when I first heard about these dark net drugs markets, I suppose I imagined in my head that they might look a little bit like, I don't know, a chat forum where you'd go on there and, and organize some kind of drug deal where you'd meet someone in a real world place and do your deal and then go back home. But obviously it's nothing like that at all. People get really sort of think this is an incredibly sophisticated, complicated world, but it's really not. This is an old uh, screen grab from one of the Silk Road replacements. I, I mean, and, and the whole thing just works. These online marketplaces for drugs where you sign in using Tor, not with your real name or anything. Uh, you trade in Bitcoin and you communicate with the vendors and you have all sorts of different uh, options and choices. It's really just like a cheaply run version of Amazon or eBay. It's exactly the same. Thousands of options. And the whole thing runs just like, and this is what I'm talking about, criminals being like me and you, runs just like Amazon or eBay. As in, once you've bought your illegal drugs, or once you've bought your stolen data, you go back on the site and leave a little written review for the very excellent customer service. Thank you so much. And what this has done, of course, is sort of drive up the competition between competing vendors on these dark net marketplaces. So you get this explosion of competition and choice and innovation. So you do have buy one, get one free deals on stolen data. When I was doing my research on the dark net markets, you had organic fair trade cocaine that was being sold. Where the vendor was saying that you can, you know, 20% of our profits are going to go back into education programs in Guatemala and stuff like this. Competition and choice. That's all it really is about. 
Now, the darknet markets are, are interesting primarily because they just simply reveal that a load of criminals got together and thought, how could we use encrypted communications, an anonymous web browser, and cryptocurrency to massively increase our possible market? So simple, so obvious. Now, what these have done, I mean, there's a lot of up and downs in these online marketplaces. They're still there, but the authorities are getting a lot better at closing them down. Uh, it's a long and complicated and convoluted story, but they're still online. They're still operating. They've changed form slightly. But essentially what they have done, lesson number one, is simply democratised access to either being able to access drugs or stolen data or to be able to find other criminals that you want to get together with and do an inside job on some company. Democratise the access to the basically low-level, easy-to-use tools of cybercrime. See, when I, I sometimes remember when I, was, uh, when I was 12 years old, I got banned from Woolworths for stealing a WWF uh, figurine. And that was, uh, I was... I was with a bigger kid, you know. That was, a, that was my excuse. That was like the, that was my, my one run-in with the law. And that was all I knew. That's all I could do. I wouldn't have known how to get involved in credit card fraud, age four. An impossible aged 14, but age 14 now, it's extremely easy to go onto the dark net and get involved in credit card fraud, because it takes about 30 seconds to go on there, and you can buy loads of these credit cards. So the dark net markets really, forget about all the horror stories about them, all they are essentially doing is taking widely accessible tools, making it easier for people to access the tools of cybercrime. It's simple, and that is not going to change. So if that's about democratising the access of tools for cybercrime, this is my other big story that I've been working on for a long time. I, I, I was here a few months ago, and I did promise a bit of an update on this for anyone that was here. If anyone knows where this woman is, please do let me know, because I have been looking for her now for over four and a half years. I actually thought I'd nearly found her, um, and then I felt kind of stupid when she appeared on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list six months ago. I realise, yeah, I probably hadn't nearly found her, had I? Because the FBI don't know where she is either. Dr. Ruja Ignatova, brief summary, and I'll give you the update. Very brief summary. 2014, she turns up out of nowhere, tells the world that she's created the next Bitcoin, travels all around the world selling this to people, saying the price is going to go up just like Bitcoins went up. You're all going to get extremely rich. But the big difference was we are not selling and buying Bitcoin on an exchange platform. We're selling it in the same way that you buy and sell Tupperware or Avon or Herbalife. It's a multi-level marketing scheme, a.k.a. pyramid scheme, essentially a Ponzi scheme. But, and yet for three years, this thing grew like you wouldn't believe. Four billion euros was invested by a million people around the world from 175 countries, 50 million in the UK alone. It was extremely obvious, frankly, to anyone that really looked at it, that this was a pyramid scheme. The price of one coin kept going up and up and up, but no one could ever actually turn it back into normal money. Next month, next year, it's coming, don't worry. And then just as the authorities are getting onto her, she actually had a mole inside Europol HQ, Dr. Ruja disappears on a Ryanair flight. No one would ever suspect this on a Ryanair flight to Athens, Greece, and has not been seen since October 2017. And then, it, like I said, six months ago or so, she appears on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list. Actually, um, the reason, if anyone listens to the podcast, we haven't done any for a while is because she's probably being supported by organised criminals. And I'm not, I'm not really... I got into this because it's like a cyber security story. And now I'm supposed to break into the world of Bulgarian organised crime groups. And I don't really fancy it very much. It's taken a bit longer than I thought. But the lessons from this story are important. Because, again, I think it epitomises the way a lot of cyber criminals actually work. Forget all the technology. Forget all of the clever stuff that she was saying about how our one-coin blockchain works. This was an old-fashioned pyramid scheme using the hype and excitement of crypto to basically dazzle people, to blind them into thinking this was something different. 
This is sort of Bernie Madoff. This is very old school. But what she was able to do, and again, it's very typical of all criminals, is to look extremely credible, look completely identical to the legitimate companies that are out there, like Sam Bankman Freed. <laughs> okay, sorry, inside joke. So she appears on these magazines, she looks like she's the real deal. People who don't understand the technology but want to get in on Bitcoin think, oh sure, she's appeared on the cover of Forbes magazine. She's been spoken at an event hosted by The Economist. I don't understand how any of this weird technology works, but that seems to me that she must be credible. And criminals and anyone that deals with phishing attacks and stuff knows it's all about making it look very, very, to people that are in a rush, that don't understand it very well, it looks completely the same as the real thing. But the second thing she did, and again, this is very, very typical of any online criminal, is she played to the, basically the people's psychological weaknesses. And the one she played to was the fear of missing out. FOMO, the fear that you, could, everyone's had a friend that got rich on Bitcoin. Isn't it so annoying? Gonna hate it when you hear about your mate that invested in 2012. They're not smarter than you. They're not wiser or more diligent. They just got lucky. They got in early. And everyone suffers from this fear of missing out. And it drives incredibly <laughs> irrational decisions. And she knows that and she plays to that. Crim online criminals are as much masters of psychology as they are of technology. And most of the time, they are playing to psychological weaknesses. So she would say, oh, the, don't miss out this time. You heard about that guy who sold 10,000 Bitcoin for a pizza in 2011. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. And the people that fell for this are the people that thought they were too smart to fall for it. Because they thought, I'm never gonna, I'm never gonna be tricked into this. I'm too clever. But they don't realize that they, like all of us, are guilty of FOMO. We all feel it. So beware of the sort of psychological tricks that they pull. In the UK, someone with a PhD in finance invested hundreds of thousands of pounds into one coin. A doctor in the US, a very highly, highly trained doctor, invested $900,000 into a pyramid scheme. It's all gone. So beware of the psychology. And this is how she did it, of course, saying the price is going to keep going up and up and up, and you're all going to get extremely rich. <coughs> so Darknet, to me, is about democratization and how that's going to continue. The one coin story is really about psychology and how criminals use psychology. There we go. This is just the price. Now, I want to show you how I can see this working for something like OpenAI and ChatGPT, because everyone is interested in it. Everyone's suddenly thinking, oh my goodness me, how is this going to be used? How's it going to be used in cyber security and how's it going to be used by hackers? Well, let me just show you a little example of, of, of a deep fake of Elon Musk talking on a podcast to show you just how good this is. I think there's some um, merit to Dogecoin, even though it was obviously created as a joke. Um, is that it, it actually does have a much higher uh, transaction volume capability than Bitcoin. Um, That's actually, you can't tell how good that is, but actually, sorry, that isn't a deep fake. That is actually Elon Musk talking about Dogecoin. Sorry. <laughs> that must be the wrong video I put up. It's not a deep fake at all. He is actually talking about Dogecoin. The reason I wanted to show you that is because I think the biggest thing that we are going to see in the next five years or so is not just the proliferation of believable deep fakes, uh, synthetically generated media, whether it's videos or text or audio. It's going to be that you're going to just, everything that is a legitimate piece of content is going to be questionable because everyone will say, well, that's a deep fake. No, it's not a deep fake. That's the real Elon Musk. No, I think it's a deep fake. Deep denials. People not being entirely sure which one is true and which one is not true. I think working out the authenticity of content, whatever field of work you are in and which thing comes from a real human and which one does not, is going to be the biggest challenge for, well, in my work at the BBC particularly, for broadcasters. It's going to be an enormous challenge. and We've got no idea how we're actually going to deal with this. 
But in the world of cyber security and cyber attack, when I just think about everything I know about the online criminal mind, obviously they are thinking about the same thing. I wonder how I can use this to, I wonder how I can use this to try to make my work slightly simpler, make more money, make it easier for me. And we've already seen several examples just starting to bubble up of criminals who are, who are actually trying to apply this technology in their way of attacking people. So you already have CEOs phoning up their colleagues, demanding payments being made at short notice, all of it being generated by a machine. We've always had the idea that when you're working in this field, well, if you're not sure about an invoice that's come through, make sure you pick up the phone and speak to the CEO. Does it really need, you know, did you actually send that? But what happens when you're not even sure if you are actually talking to the CEO because it's a synthetically generated voice at the other end? We've already seen examples of that happening. Automated, low-level phishing attempts. We've all had the emails from our friends and family saying this, that, and the other. But what happens when it's a phone call? What happens when it's a video call? What happens when we're really not quite sure that we can trust our eyes? This is what I think is happening. It's, the, it's kind of like the two types of trends I've already discussed. Democratization of amazing tools for people to use, plus, with ChatGPT and the others, a psychological trick. It's going to be playing on people's psychological weakness. Oh, can I really trust that that is my CEO asking me for this or not? This is clearly going to be one of the future challenges for cybersecurity. So I would just invite you all to sort of think with your, think with your, cyber, with your cyber criminal mind. How do you think this is going to play out? And it's a really simple exercise. And it's the same thing that I do when I work on these sorts of projects. I just see a new technology and I think, I wonder how a very smart criminal sees this. I wonder what they might do with it. I wonder how they might apply it. And I guarantee whatever you come up with, they've already thought of it and they're probably already doing it. So let me give you two very, very quick pieces of advice, the things that I think really matter. The first is, if we are entering into this world where we're going to see a sort of proliferation of very, very sophisticated sort of social engineering attacks using synthetically generated media, social engineering by smart machines, essentially, then again, psychology becomes really important. How to make sure people are guarding against the, the common psychological tricks that people try to pull on you. And when I talk to people about how to avoid investing in a cryptocurrency scam, I never say to them, have you looked at the underlying technology and value proposition? Because they just fall asleep. I say, did they try to rush you into investing quickly? Yeah, be really careful of that, because Warren Buffett doesn't invest in things quickly. So why do you need to invest it? Have they tried to tell you that the price of investment is going to double in six weeks, so you need to get in quick? Are they trying to make you feel FOMO? Are they trying to make you feel rushed? These are the things that I think you need to get people to really internalize when thinking about cybersecurity. And the way to do that is not through an email, probably not through a seminar. I think the best way to do it is to encourage people that have fallen for this stuff to be honest about it. The whole reason we did this enormous BBC investigation into the OneCoin Ponzi scam was because we thought it was going to be one of the best ways to teach other people and the way that they remember is because they hear that their friend, or they hear on the radio from us, that someone they really trusted actually fell for a Ponzi scheme. And they're honest about it. And then they don't feel so stupid themselves. And then they guard themselves against it. So any time within your companies, any mistake anyone's made, anyone clicked on the wrong link, be honest about it. Tell everyone about it. And that is going to sort of help people remember the emotional, the sort of psychological tricks that people pull and are, are more guarded against that in future. And the second one is just this, demo, this trend of democratisation. It's getting easier to do this stuff now. And criminals will do it. We're never going to stop all of it. Everything, I mean, I totally agree with what Drew just said about trying this, getting involved in it, giving it a go, what can you learn from it? But also I think, for me, 
preparedness becomes more important than ever because it will go wrong, someone will get through, exploits will get found the more it's done by machines. And what people will get really annoyed about is if they see that companies weren't prepared with a backup plan or weren't open when it happened, weren't honest with their customers about it. Preparedness becomes everything. And one reason that is so important is just because how much more people value their data, how much more they value their security now than they did five or 10 years ago. So as speaking as a journalist, that's really important. I always think, when the worst things happen, are you prepared to go and do the evening standard interview and say, at least I'd done X, Y, and Z. At least I had state-of-the-art backup systems in place. So don't blame the company. Blame the criminals. Because if they don't blame the criminals, they blame the company. And that's not where you want to be. And with that, I will stop. And thank you all very much indeed for listening. Okay.